Okay, so um, <clears throat> welcome everyone back to uh, our lecture video. Uh, so last week, um, originally on the schedule was planned to have chapters seven through nine um, and the midterm, but I had second thoughts on that. I thought it was a little too much to throw new content at you on top of a midterm. So uh, these are the notes. <clears throat> um, this does cover chapter seven, eight, and nine, which was supposed to be during the midterm week. Um, but we're also talking chapter 10, which was always supposed to be the next week. So this will be our lecture stuff. So bear with me. Uh, we're going over four total chapters. Um, but oddly enough, they work really well together. So uh, hopefully it makes sense and we'll be able to get through with this. Um, as you can tell, <clears throat> excuse me, other than some minor coughing and whatnot, my voice is actually doing a whole lot better. So I can actually go back through and teach now. So I will uh, go back as soon as I can and uh, record something for the, that early, I believe it was chapter two and three or something along those lines. I will uh, record that in the coming days. <clears throat> anyway. So, um, really, I kind of want to break it down, at least today, to talk about the, our main sections we're going to be talking. Uh, obviously, delinquency is the big thing, as we already know. Uh, that's the primary focus of our text, is delinquency. Um, but so, we're going to be talking about delinquency... In particular, we're going to talk about uh, the family aspects of it, uh, how family impacts these things. We're going to talk about how the peer group, uh, so not peer, but peers. Uh, we're going to talk about how school factors into this. And then last but certainly not least, uh, we're going to talk about drug use. So those are our four main uh areas each one was a chapter so chapter seven was family chapter eight was peer groups chapter nine was school which fit perfectly and then drug use was kind of uh separate from all that so that's why it was its own thing but we'll lump it all together because there is some connections to be made um so <clears throat> to start with we're going to talk about the family first obviously and so um realistically one of the most important things that needs to be understood at this point and it's from a uh, sociology and a society aspect and i'm pretty sure we all can agree on this um but that is that the american family as was once understood is changing and so if you've never heard this term before uh there was something called the nuclear family This was the ideal that all Americans should aim for. It was a two-parent household, 2.5 kids, house, white picket fence. Like, this was the American family, was the nuclear family, the two parents... Uh, at the time, definitely, it was a male and a female, uh, two and a half kids. It was based off of an average, uh, anywhere between two and three kids, sometimes four, uh, having a house of your own with a traditional white picket fence. That was the ideal. That was the goal. But if you're familiar with uh, our society today and anything like that, the nuclear family is not this anymore. We, this is not standard. This is not what the American family looks like anymore. Um, we, we do have this, uh, and our textbook calls it an issue, and while it is kind of an issue, it's, it's very narrow-minded to consider it as the sole factor in how uh, delinquency comes about, and we'll address it when we get to it, but... Um, there are a lot of single parent households.
and even more so, there are non-married. And my other favorite, non-traditional. And this is just a catch-all for any kind of non-husband and wife first time. Like, the American family is not just two parents, two and a half kids, a house with a white picket fence. Not every family has a house. Some people rent their entire lives. Some people have no kids. Some people have more kids. Some people have one kid. Uh, if they own a house, they don't have a fence. Fences are expensive, believe it or not. Um, like all these things, they're, they're not the same. And there is a misunderstanding and a disconnect between the, the imaginary American dream and the American what is and what is not. And so it's important to note that while this is something that we kind of aim for as a uh, people, and I put that all in air quotes because, well, everyone's a little bit differently, there is something to be said about this concept that the American family is changing. And that is, it is having a direct impact on delinquency rates. Um, and that's not just, you know, the textbook being a little out of it or a little, you know, less than great or a little outdated. No, there is an impact on delinquency. Um, <clears throat> because as the American family has changed, so too have other things changed. And that's kind of what's important to understand is that um, with a single parent family or a non-traditional family, or the other thing with the nuclear family is one parent was the working parent who, you know, went out and earned the money and the other one was the homemaker. Traditionally, the woman was the homemaker and the man was the uh, breadwinner. <clears throat> like truly these are antiquated gender roles and stereotypes, but because this was actually a belief in everything, as it changed, all of a sudden, um, things like childcare. When you had a, a parent who was a stay-at-home mom who took care of the house, you had a person to be childcare. When you have one parent at all, and only, and they're working, or you have two parents who are both working, childcare becomes an issue. Um, the other thing that comes with this as well, and obviously you can have one without the other, um, like you can have economic stress without uh, having the need for childcare, but truly economic stress, and we've talked a little bit about it before in our textbook, <coughs> excuse me, but economic stress is a big impact on uh on delinquency rates, at least according to the data we have. Um, economic stress creates difficult situations and difficult family life, which in turn has a direct impact on a potential juvenile delinquent and sometimes leads them towards delinquency. And that's, that's where this issue is. That's where this issue comes up, is that when there is these kind of stressful situations and things aren't quite happening uh, the way they should at home, we end up losing out a little bit. And so the economic stress uh, changes these things. Uh, our textbook also brings up that uh, teenage moms and single moms, and while, yeah, just because there was a single parent or a uh, teen parent doesn't necessarily mean that their kids are going to be juvenile delinquents, but unfortunately the data shows that they have a higher potential for it. And that has to do with childcare, economic stress, uh, being ready to be a parent. Um, for any of my parents who are taking this class, I ask you and wonder, uh, were you ready to be a parent when you had a child? And if you are not one of the parents in this class and you've not had a child, I ask you, if you were to have a child right now, today, would you be ready to be a parent? And that changes a lot of things. I'm 
I am not a parent. I do not have any biological children myself, but I have played a father role for my nephews. And so uh, while I have not done all the parental things, I've had a lot of that experience and it means a lot. And I understand not being ready and being ready. Like this is a very deep thing and which is why the data shows that teen parents, teen moms in particular, tend to have a higher rate that their child are, is going to be a juvenile delinquent simply because just being unprepared. And again, that's not to say that it doesn't work out for the better. That's not saying that just because a teenage mother has a child that their child's going to be a delinquent. That's not what I'm saying. Uh, the data just shows that they have a higher rate to be uh, delinquent. And because I mentioned economic stress, it's just important to remind you about 7 million American youth uh, live in extreme poverty, which means they live uh, significantly below the uh, minimum wage line, that poverty line. So uh, just important to remember. So as well with economic stress, the unfortunate reality, and I hate to say it, but um, if you've had me before, you're familiar that sometimes I like to talk. I like to talk about somewhat controversial issues that really go on in the world. Uh, this is one of those moments. The unfortunate, harsh reality is that not many people care about the poor. So, if an individual is below a certain economic threshold. Expecting someone who has money to say, oh, I feel bad for them and give money, that doesn't happen. There are very few cases where it does, but it's not a common thing. And uh, when people talk about public funds and uh, public programs, they're meant to help with this. But the inevitable problem at the end of the day is that we don't... People don't want to give their money if it's just going to go to what they consider a less than worthy person, a drug dealer, a drug addict, a this and that. They can come up with a hundred million excuses not to give money. And so when there's not funding, problems happen. So there, there is a uh, cycle of poverty that is unfair, uh, that it's just important to kind of keep uh, thought through this process. Um, but... As a little segue into the next piece, but also to uh, bring us back around to the idea that, again, we're talking about fam delinquency and in particular how the family, how peer groups, how school and how drug use has an impact on that. Uh, just a reminder that the family is the primary unit where children learn values and attitudes that guide their actions through lives. So they are a very large impact on children especially in their developing, their developmental parts. So like as they're becoming uh, adults, as they're learning how the world works, the family is very important. So that's an important thing to note. Hint, hint, nudge, nudge. All right. So in your textbooks on, excuse me, uh, I don't like that. Why did it do that? Why did it do that? Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. My computer went a little weird. So, um, on page, what is it? Whoops. Excuse me. Um, page 185. No, 184. 184 of your textbook is figure 7.3. And it looks like this. It's got big old circles. And it highlights this like center area of the uh, four circles. Um, this is what is called, at least in our textbook, and it's important to note, the family influence on behavior. So you know what it looks like, and so you can know what to look for. Um, but it's this idea that these different areas, so family breakup, we have family conflict, 
we have family deviants and we have family effectiveness. So the idea is that the influence that the family has on an individual for delinquency is factored in by these. So if the family has a history of can family conflict and it has its significance, the family is not a fully developed family and it's full of break breakups and people that aren't connected. Uh, family members themselves have a history of deviance and the effectiveness of communication and uh, collaboration, all these things don't mix. It creates this center point, this kind of major influence on behavior. Now, if one of the areas isn't, it doesn't mean that there's no impact or influence. It just, the strongest influence is when these four factors play together. So if you look at it as, oh, sorry. If you look at it as a bike, or rather, let's just look at it as a unicycle because I can draw a unicycle. So let's just imagine that you are trying to ride a unicycle. And so each one of these is a spoke. If you have, let's just say, one spoke, the wheel's not going to be great. You're probably going to break the wheel. But it's still possible that it could run. We had a second spoke, a little bit more secure now, but, you know, still not perfect. Add a third spoke. Now we're getting into something serious. And then the fourth one, well, that's a good looking wheel. So the idea here is that as each one of those plays a factor, there's a greater influence that the family has on the potential juvenile delinquent's behavior. So I hope that helps make sense out of all this. I was trying to make sure that um, that example and everything made sense. Um, but... Before we talk about something really sad and unfortunate, uh, I do want to just mention what a broken home is. According to our textbook, we have a definition. A broken home is a home in which one or both parents are absent due to divorce or separation. Children in such an environment may be prone to antisocial behavior. Please note, may be prone. This does not mean that because someone grew up in a quote-unquote broken home or a home where people are divorced, that doesn't mean that they're going to be a juvenile delinquent. It just means that they may be. And of course, we can make the wonderful debate of, well, what about families that are together? Don't they also have potential delinquents? Well, yes. That's why we say may be. Um, and so as we transition, um, there are... I'm trying to think the way I want to approach this because we're about to get into a uh, heavy topic. So um, if you're interested, by the way, I, this is my little side note. I am an individual who uh, does come from a broken family. I'm familiar with this and uh, I think it's hilarious, uh, at least for me, that I'm like, oh yeah, the effects of divorce did not really do a lot to this to me, but... Um, there is stuff to consider, um, but there is a list of research results and findings between divorce and delinquency on page 186. Um, I encourage you to look at that. I might have a discussion question um, like on the actual final based off of this, but it's not something that would appear on a quiz. So just something to keep in mind. Um, but so we are going to take a detour and talk about the unfortunate reality with uh, family and delinquency. And so I am just going to put a real brief warning. Uh, we are going to talk about abuse. Um, so that's going to be something that it's, we're also going to be mentioning at least uh, briefly the Jerry Sandusky case, which is about um, child sexual assault. So if that is something that does bother you, um, you can skip ahead in the lecture a little bit. 
Um, I will make sure that I kind of have something to let you know that we're okay. Um, but it's just important to understand what we're talking about and how this too plays a role. Um, so there's your warning. All right. So one of the things that we have to, uh, discuss and understand is that there is abuse and unfortunately uh where is my pen there it is um abuse is a problem but abuse is also okay i was gonna say my pen just stopped working for a second okay um okay something's going on with my pen so um I don't know what's going on, so apologies on that. Um, that. That did not go well. So, apologies on that. I'll try to get it fixed uh, quickly. But, so, abuse obviously is any kind of physical uh, action. And I, I don't mean, like, it's little. What I mean is, like, abuse is... It is wide-ranging. Um, abuse, according to our textbook, is defined as any physical, emotional, or sexual trauma to a child, including neglecting to give proper care and attention for which no reasonable explanation can be found. And that's something that's important. No reasonable explanation can be found. Um, this isn't just, you know, oh, well, someone was being bad, I hit them, and they got a bruise. And that's not abuse. It, it toes a very fine line, but it's not technically abuse. Abuse is you know, refusing to feed someone, locking them in rooms, physically beating on them constantly. Uh, this is abuse. That is a serious issue. Um, obviously, like I said, there is the Sandusky case from 2012. Um, if you're from this area, if you're from Pennsylvania, you are familiar with the Jerry Sandusky case, or at least you've heard the name before, hopefully. Um, this has to do with Penn State. Uh, and there was uh, part of the football coaching team uh, was a one Jerry Sandusky who was eventually outed for sexual abuse. He sexually assaulted several minors over decades at summer camps for, for young children, and it was really messed up. And eventually he was found and charged and all that. But it was an example of the problematic nature of this in general because it was known for a little bit and it was swept under the rug. And so that's where issues come about, other, among the other issues that we've already kind of touched on. But so there is a whole thing about abuse and uh, obviously, there is data to show that individuals who are abused have a higher potential to be an abuser as they grow up. Uh, they become the abuser. There's there's psychology behind this. There's a lot of different stuff to this. And um, it's just important to note that as far as delinquency is concerned, um, when we're thinking about the family and family deviance, this falls under that. This is abuse is part of family deviance. Um, it is part of the impact that can be played by the family or by an outside individual and guide an individual towards uh, their own future. And so obviously neglect. Um, neglect is different from abuse, but it is a type of abuse. Neglect is willingly not being part of it purposely uh, abstaining from some kind of uh, nourishment. So 
Passive neglect by a parent or guardian in where you, you deprive children of food, shelter, health care, or love. Um, this is something that we can see not just in, uh, not just, sorry, I'm struggling to phrase this right because I don't want to do it a disservice and I don't want this to come off as like wrong. Um, neglect is a harder one to see. Abuse is typically easy because there's some physical aspect of it. Yes, there's emotional abuse and some sexual abuse is not seen. Um, but neglect is one of those harder ones to spot. Um, and then, of course, on top of all that. Oh, yeah, it's just not going to work for me. OK, and that answers that question. Um, the other thing with neglect is abandonment. And now, this one should be pretty straightforward. Uh, abandonment is the active choice of leaving and not engaging with a child at all. Um, this is my own personal demon that I deal with. Um, my father abandoned me, so it does play a role in child development. It does play a role in how the individual uh, engages with their world. So it's important to note that this is something, it's not just, you know, oh, well, I guess that's something. No, it, it really does have an impact on uh, individual lives, and so... Abandonment is one of those types of abuse that children can experience from their families. Um, so I believe there was something else I wanted to say, but I don't remember what it was. Um, I don't have it marked down uh, in particular, but uh, obviously, as you can tell, we're going across the board in different parts of the chapter uh, only because I'm trying to highlight the most important pieces. A lot of it is very important, but if I just sat here and went through every single thing, we'd have five-hour lecture, and that's not that's not useful for you, and it's not useful for me. Um, but it's important to note, as I mentioned, that uh, regardless how abuse is defined or what it does, there is an impact on the child. And uh, part of the thing that's interesting is we're not sure how impactful it is. Uh, that data is still not out there. We don't have a concrete reason for it. But we do know, excuse me, we, well, okay. Apparently, I'm just struggling today. Um. I things don't work my way usually. Um, anyway, while we don't have an exact answer as to what um, what the impact is, we do know that there is an impact. And so we do have uh, not that it's cool, but um, we do actually have a decent amount of uh, survey and results that we can point to in particular to find out. So like uh, the Department of Health and Human Services hold actually a lot of data on surveys uh, in particular about child abuse. So uh, while child abuse itself is not cool and not something that we should be excited about, it's exciting to know that we do have data and research that can point us to uh, important factors and uh, data about crimes and crimes committed and then of course crimes that will are then committed by juveniles who were victims of crime and we have that kind of data uh, obviously you know we the longer we're around the longer we do this the more data we get but yeah there's there's something to be said about that um, so that is the exciting piece to this um, so of all the factors associated with child abuse, there are 
three that are discussed the most often. Okay? So, thinking about quizzes and tests and things like that. Uh, three common factors. of child abuse. Wow, this is this is just devolved so quickly. I apologize. Um but we're going to get through it. First one is Oh gosh no. Okay, we're going to redo that. We're going to do it this way because uh, this is not just working. Um, so apologies, I'm just going to type it out. So please bear with me for the moment of silence while I do this. Okay, so, perfect. So the three common factors that are brought up of child abuse uh, is that one, parents who themselves suffered abuse at some point tend to abuse their own children. Like I mentioned, it is a cycle. This does happen. Um, this is the unfortunate reality of abuse, of violence, of poverty. It is all cyclical and it's hard to break that cycle. Uh, number two, the other common factor of child abuse is uh, the more that there is an unrelated adult in the mix has an increase to the risk of abuse. Um, obviously, just because someone has a step parent or a parents live in boyfriend or girlfriend does not mean that they're going to abuse the child. But the data shows that the higher risk of abuse comes from unrelated adults, whether it's because they have no emotional connection to the child or whatnot. Um, and then the third is isolated and alienated families tend to become abusive. If they are off all by themselves and have no connection with anyone else and uh, they're really only social within themselves, there tends to be a higher rate of some sort of abuse. So these are just some of those common factors that are usually pointed out with uh, child abuse, not to say that there aren't other factors, but those are the three main ones that come back up. Hint, hint, nudge, nudge, that totally might come up on an exam or a quiz or a discussion board. Um, anyway, so um, on top of all this, I'm going to just end up doing some text pieces because they tend to allow me to write easier. Um, but we have, in 2000, there was Toxel versus Granville. Uh, this was a Troxel, sorry. I'm clearly thinking Pokemon. Uh, Toxel is a Pokemon. Uh, anyway, not that that means anything to anyone. But, uh, so, Troxel versus Granville. Uh, this was a court case where parents can raise a child as they see fit. Um... This whole decision was that so this is where they the idea of you you can't tell a parent how to raise their child and of course anyone goes well how how do you stop people from abusing them
And this is where the second part of it comes in. As long as a reasonable standard is met. So in Troxel versus Granville, this is the parents are allowed to decide how they want to raise their children, but they have to meet some sort of reasonable standard, some kind of minimal point allowed. So you can't just beat your child. Like if you're denying them safety and security, then yeah, you aren't allowed to raise your child that way. But if part of your raising is having your child do manual labor, as long as they get breaks, as long as they're treated semi-fairly and things like that, that is a reasonable standard and it is not child abuse. So that's really where that comes from. Um, but of course, this also gets into the bigger issue of um, how the courts look at abuse because obviously this is just one case and throughout its history it's the question becomes what is abuse and i know for us that's really obvious it's like we, we're talking about this this is clearly child abuse well yes but in a court of law how do you define abuse how do you show that abuse comes through uh this is you know why at the same time there's the whole idea that you can't just have a child on the stand like especially if they are a victim of some kind of like sexual assault, there's protections in place. And we'll talk about that briefly. Um, but so with this in mind, um, I want to talk about the Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act, uh, CAPTA of 1974, as well as Child Protective Services. Uh, I don't want to get too deep into this um, because CPS itself tends to be a point of discussion and argument for a lot of uh, individuals and I can understand and it's important to note that CPS was designed for good. Uh, Child Protective Services is was designed and is designed to help make sure that children are well taken care of. Now, it is important to note, it is not a perfect system. Yes, there are some really shady things with some CPS agencies and some locations. Like, yeah, it is not perfect, and I'm not going to pretend like it is. Um, but I urge you to remember that it was designed with good intent, um, Truly, it's supposed to be for the best. It's the best interest of the child, even though sometimes it's not. Um, but we're not going to get into a discussion about CPS, um, only because I just wanted to mention that they are part of this system. They're part of juvenile delinquency, especially when it comes to family abuse and child abuse. Um, if you have strong feelings about CPS, by all means, uh, write a paper about it. You can talk about it all you want. That's fine. But we're not going to get into a class discussion on it. Um, anyway, but so specifically the Child Abuse Protection and Treatment Act, uh, it gave states funding to bolster their own uh, maltreated children groups so uh, whatever program they may or may not have the whole point was this was money that was set aside for them so that they could help uh, just help children and that's why CPS is Child Protective Services is one of those services funded through CAPTA you can see where issues come in um, but going past that we got to move past it um, one thing that we should also talk about as far as how the courts play into all this uh, is that this is where advisement hearings or emergency custody hearings. Hint, hint, nudge, nudge, this might be something that shows up on a quiz. An advisement hearing, also known as an emergency custody hearing, is a preliminary protective or temporary custody hearing in which the court will review the facts and determine 
whether removal of the child is justified and notify parents of the charges against them. So if a child is taken away, there is an advisement hearing, also known as an emergency custody hearing, in which charges will be raised against the parent and the court will review all those facts and determine if the child needs to be removed or not. Period. I'm saying this the way I am because I want, when it comes time for uh, a quiz and that question to come up, I want you to all get that correct. Um, but uh, one thing that I do want to bring up is that truly the courts in all of this kind of stuff are guided by three interests. Okay, so important to note, and I believe I can actually, yeah, that's right. I love doing this because it really makes you look at it closely. So the courts are guided by three interests in any cases that they deal with regarding children. And that is the role of the parent, the protection for the child, and the responsibility of the state. If you remember, we've talked about before um, how the law sometimes views itself as acting as the responsible parent for a child, especially when a parent doesn't have that ability to be the responsible individual. So that's sometimes where that third piece really comes into play. Uh, obviously, the protection for the child is a very important decision. Um, a court it would be hopefully really hard to believe that a court or a judge or anyone would find that uh, the protection of a child would be not important and they'd put them in a dangerous situation, ideally. Um, and then obviously the role of the parents, and this is where I also have to say, um, it's a segue into something else, which is the foster system. And I want to emphasize this. Um, so I myself am not a foster kid or an adoption kid, but I've known foster kids. I've known adopted kids and I've known foster parents and adopted parents. And the goal of the foster system is reunification. The end goal for fostering is that eventually and hopefully sooner rather than later, a parent can prove themselves able to care for their own children and their they and their children can be reconciled that's a big component of this of the foster system and so when the courts are guided by those three interests this plays a big role into that now that's not to say that the foster system is not flawed and have some serious issues that need addressed i'm not saying they're not but it's important to know that the goal of the foster system is to reunify parents and children. Now, do some kids get adopted? Yes. Does that mean that the foster care system failed? No. Things can happen. Um, obviously, I'm trying to be very neutral about this. Um, this is a topic that does matter to me a lot, um, but I just want to make sure that I'm checking my own bias as we talk about this. So it's just important to note. Um, so one thing I did want to bring up real quick as far as the abused child in court, I mentioned how uh, specifically, usually with well, like 99% of the time, if it's a sexual abuse, you're not going to see the child in court, but typically uh, children aren't 
put on the stand. They're you they use some kind of like uh close uh closed circuit television like CCTV or a recorded testimony or things like this. Um still on the bench, uh Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. Uh this was her hill to die on. Um this was something that she strongly pushed for. Like people wanted to say no part of the justice system is that I'm allowed to engage with the person who's accusing me of this crime. Um, Justice Sandra Day O'Connor was like, nope, if it's a child, they're allowed to not look their adult abuser in the eyes. They're allowed to do that from a safe space. Um, So that's just something, again, cool feels like the wrong word, but it's a cool thing to be like, yeah, yeah. Let's talk about this. Let's be like, yeah, you're not allowed to look at that child you abused, you jerk. Um, So the other thing to mention, and this is what's going to wrap up this chapter and where I say apologies again for uh, the mess with the notes. I'm hopefully going to be getting this fixed before we go into the next part. Um, But victims of childhood violence are significantly more likely to become violent I mentioned this before. This is the cycle of violence. Um, And I've mentioned and teased it before, uh, not just in this class, but in other classes. But there is a cycle to these things. When one thing happens, it tends to repeat. It happens again and again and again and again. Um, And if you want the actual, like, data for it, uh, on page 204 of our textbook, there is something about that. Um, But it's just important to note. Um, that there is a cycle of violence uh, when a family member commits some kind of abuse to a child in their own family. That child has a stronger likelihood that they too are going to be violent. And if they have children, they're likely going to abuse their children and continue the cycle. Um, It's not right. It's not good. It is the unfortunate reality of this kind of situation. So that's chapter seven. That's family and delinquency. Next time we're going to talk about peers and delinquency. And oh boy, do we have some stuff to talk about there. Um, So thank you very much. Uh, I will see you in the next part.